all CEOs, me included, we don't actually know what we're doing. They're all sharks, so all you got to do, though, is no shark bait. I don't think we've ever talked about this before. <laughs> we can capture all of the wallet share. First place you start is with the product. That's just the first nut. This is the Capital Stack. Hey, everybody, this is David Paul, the host of the Capital Stack podcast, where I talk to founders, operators, and investors about all things value creation and startups. Today, I'm speaking to a longtime friend of mine, Matt Ekstrom, a sales leader uh, and somebody who is, I would say, an expert in and around human resource tech. Um, we also used to be fat together. And since then, you know, I'm less fat. I don't know how Matt looks. I haven't seen a body shot in a while. Um, but he, his face looks good. Oh, thank you. So yeah. is yours. Thank you. <laughs> um, you working out? Uh, well, I've been, I've been on the injury list for a few months. But yes, ideally in a perfect world. How do you manage your manorexia? <laughs> My wife keeps me in check. Does so she? Being crazy. Yeah. Does she say like, does she say like <clears throat> you're getting a little tubby or does she say like relax? No, it's the opposite. Like stop counting your calories. Yeah. But like, I, like I don't really care what my wife thinks about how I look, honestly. No, it's more, it's more about me, but no, she, right. she's the one who keeps me in check, make sure I'm like not being too anal. Cause, um, yeah, I've got, I've got that obsessive problem. Yeah. Well, the thing is, is once you're fat, you just know like how sucks it is to be yeah. fat and going back yeah. to fat is not a great, is not a great feeling. It's my, it's not my biggest time here, but it's one of them. Like, you know, like. Because yeah, I, I getting fat, losing your child, yeah. <laughs> you know, like, yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah. there's like the, the real, right the real there. bad ones. Yeah. It's right up there. No, but this is literally within my control, you know? So, right. Uh, yeah. So exactly. Uh, Matt, what's going on with you, man? What do you, what have you been up to? You know, the last year or so I've been, uh, more or less advising slash consulting with a HR tech company um, based in California. Um, very early stage. Um, so that's primarily what I've been doing, just go to market strategy, some sort of product, uh, product stuff and sales and marketing. And so Matt and I have gone back to 2015. Um, we're both from New Orleans, actually. We didn't meet in New Orleans, thank God. Um, that would have been no, bad. But we knew common people like very closely and somehow we never ran into each other. Until we <laughs> I were know. Literally sitting next to each other in Scottsdale. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Very, very unusual. Yeah. Um, but you've been doing <laughs> HR tech for, you know, coming up on a decade, right? More than, more than a decade. Yeah. More than a decade because you were, yeah. you were doing it before I knew you. So yeah. Where where was it started and when you entered it and how do you look at it now? How has it evolved? Um, I think it's, you know, so I'm, I'm kind of going back in my history. I, literally my first job out of college was at monster.com. Um, <clears throat> so man, that was what, 2006. Um, but my first real foray into really having a broader understanding of the landscape was my first HR tech, uh, conference, which I believe was in 2012, no, 2011, I think. And, uh, that's when I realized just how big this industry was. Cause I got outside of the job board, very focused on small and medium sized businesses and stuff like right. that to seeing the broader landscape. And I would say it just continues to fracture, um, like split her off. It, once, as soon as I think, <clears throat> which was the case for a number of years, that it's going to consolidate and merge, something else comes along, some new idea um, comes along, and you know, fifteen more companies 
uh, <laughs> sprout up. Um, it's just, it's incredible. Uh, I think there's a Talent Tech Labs that puts out an ecosystem infographic every year. And it's just like, it can't fit on one computer screen. They have yeah. tabs. It's, uh, I, I thought the MarTech infographic was big. Yeah. I I feel like this is bigger. It's it's insane. Do do you think that HR tech, I mean, has improved the employee onboarding hiring experience overall? Like through all no. that investment? No. <laughs> no. Like like a hard no or No. Uh absolutely not. Um and I don't I really don't sit this at the feet of um the entrepreneurs or those companies necessarily. I think there's some, there's still improvements they can make, but overall I think it's really difficult to in general improve that process. Um, more difficult in HR slash talent tech than it is say in sales tech to improve the sales process. Cause there's really two major, major players in CRM systems. Mm -hmm. on the sales side obviously salesforce and hubspot's really really come a long way um in hr slash talent you have crms and ats's and there's not a dominant player um hmm. well, what so, about bullhorn yeah yeah i mean they're there too but they they primarily focus on staffing uh staffing companies got it um but what what I envision <laughs> the problem with that side of 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 the of the landscape because there's CRM and ATS systems, there's no one dominant player. Each one has their own individual ecosystem with integrations and stuff like that. Um, so it's just so many different options. So there's not a there's not a more uniform process and experience that a candidate or an employee being onboarded will necessarily have. That's my that's my two cents on it. And they and no one really created a category. Like I mean, HubSpot. I don't think I don't think HubSpot created a category, but you know they made a standard. I think in and around their content library and their academy, you know, on teaching best in class practices in and around marketing and sales enablement. No, there's not. I mean, and there are really good ideas out there that I would like to see. Um. Take take some of the uh, the process out of the hands of the candidates having to do all that. Like job sync comes to mind. I think they're a really interesting, um, really interesting company that's sort of helping uh, helping a lot of the players out there. But um, but no, there's not. And there's tons of influencers that have been talking about candidate experience in particular for a very long time. There's a whole uh, award show called the Candies. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that, you know it's oh uh, god yeah it's been around a while yeah the like, candies um, but you know uh, it, it, as is the case the technology can only do so much for for that experience it's up to the recruiters as well and the hiring managers to to put the effort in as well and and often up to the c-level to care enough to make their experience good but you know Uprooting a CRM or ATS for a different one is a, is a major undertaking too. Well, I mean, that you you mentioned something really interesting. It's it's um, ultimately how a company rec recruits and receives an employee is a you know is going to be is going to be created based on the culture of the company. Mm -hmm. Right. You know, n naturally by the leaders that that person chooses and how they've how they've been hired, mm -hmm. um, dot, dot, dot. And, you know, I, I, I've been looking at a lot in and around healthcare recruiting and healthcare workforce stuff. And mm -hmm. I'm seeing these little companies. I've been doing some little angel checks here and there. But like at the end of the day, is software going to fix the recruiting and retention problem within healthcare? Because like they they didn't give a shit before, why are they going to give a shit now? Because there's a, there's an app. Mm -hmm. No, it, it can help be seamless. For example, if I go to uh, a job posting, and I don't apply to many jobs, but I, I was I was doing some investigating for a potential content piece. Um, but if I go to a job 
and uh, or a job listing, and I click to apply, and it asks me to create a username and password. I'm out, done. Yeah, already. Like right. End of story. And you'd be surprised how many still have that process. That's a problem with the technology. Right. And uprooting a system like that is going to take a long time, no matter what the intentions of that the company's current. Uh, talent management and talent acquisition teams feel about it, whether their chief people officer cares deeply or not. Um, and the checks they're willing to write, the CFO would approve it. And then everyone's got to be on board like, Hey, is this problem big enough that I need to, that I need to completely operate and migrate the system? It could take months, if not much, much longer. But even more, if, more even the longer. point solutions that are out there, right? Like mm-hmm. what, has the HR budget just been increasing? And I mean, it, it can't be increasing because there's more margin and efficiency in the HR like realm. Like what what is it? Like how how are more how are how are companies able to spend more and more on HR tech? How are they able to? Yeah. I mean, it just seems to me it's like, okay, you have it, it's like it's like a ed tech, right? You have an LMS, you have, you know, student, you have an SIS. Mm-hmm. Right. You have that set budget, but it seems like HR tech and sales enablement, you know, the, the stack gets bigger, right. Mm-hmm. With point solutions, um, sales, I think you might be able to justify because you're like, Hey, we can actually get more. Right. Mm. Um, there's a, there's the ROI is less fuzzy, right. Mm-hmm. Uh, with then HR tech where allegedly you can, you know, so how does, I mean, like, do you, do you think from an HR, like somebody, uh, someone who's procuring HR software, I mean, budgets probably increase naturally with the with the economy. More money gets raised, et cetera. But I mean, is when does that end? Well, I th- I think I think a couple of things. If you can cut heads by implementing a piece of software, that helps. Uh, meaning within your department, um, not advocating it, but that is a justification. Mm-hmm. Second, you know, if you're if you're if your headcount's growing over time, people are going to say, "Yes, I." So if I come around, if I come around, if I'm, you know, if we're releasing a new product and we have a, a huge initiative behind it, so I'm increasing budgets across the board. We're going to need new, need new staff. You're inevitably going to say, "Well, it's very important we get the right people. What do you need?" Right? Um, at that point, you don't have time to migrate a solution, but you have time to add a solution, and you have the budget to do it. Right? Mm-hmm. Um, but this just exacerbates the problem in the long run, right? Like right. to your point, you're adding point solutions to it. You're inevitably adding technical debt to this solu- to the problem that you're going to have at some point that you're going to have to face. Um, yeah, I think over. I think overall, um, you know, people will say and they'll and they'll vote with their budget to say that you know our people are our most important asset. Mm. <laughs> you know, <laughs> right. Uh, what better way to show it than uh, than keep adding, uh, <laughs> keep buying shit? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so you've also, I mean, so you you've covered and you've been in and around HR tech companies, but specifically in the sales and marketing function. Mm-hmm. So what's the parallel between that with you and you know sales enablement and tools you've used? I, you were a founder of a sales enablement company. I remember you didn't take my term sheet. Um, Asshole, and was how do you? Have, say, have, you like would still I've told be around this before. <laughs> <laughs> but tell me, tell me, like a little bit about um, how that 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 business has evolved, and from your perspective, running sales teams, how that's been innovated. Yeah, it's interesting. Uh, you know, going back to that that stage, I mean, sales sales loft and outreach were big at that point, um, but they weren't nearly as big as they became and I guess are to this day. Um, it's been interesting. I think that's been a pro- that and HubSpot's emergence as a real CRM that I'm seeing more and more out there, especially on job descriptions for even sales leadership, you know, like experience with HubSpot. Well, that's, mm-hmm. that's telling. Um, you know, other than that, I don't see, you know, there's, there. It's still kind of talking about the same things. It's the same uh, shit, right? It's the same thing, you know. And, and I, I think we're going to see a reckoning with that, you know. Um, I guess text messaging has kind of made more of an emergency. 
uh, emergence, uh, but but not in the sense of like spam texting, but like being able to use that as part of the sales process once you've made that first contact. But overall, I would say I think the real reckoning for sales is going to be, and to a degree recruiting um, as well, is going to be what if I can't get into their inbox and what if I can't reach them by phone? Because uh, everyone's blocking everything. Yeah. Um, you know, it's uh, how, how are you going to do it? Um, and so, and so how is, how is the B2B world doing that now? Because if you are a sale, I mean, like there's only so many LinkedIn messages that you're going to respond to, if any, um, same with emails. I mean, it's like, like what, do you, what, what what's a salesperson to do? The, the, the inbound method is no longer a thing, right? Well, in, inbound inbound could be with with the content side of thing, but you're Got really it. you're really inside. I meant sorry, inside sales. That's what I meant. Okay. Yeah. 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 Um, I think I think it's being smarter about things. I think the number one thing I would do as a sales leader today is really evaluate how big is my SDR team. Uh, how big do they need to be, right? Um, if I had a team of eight, I might cut it down to three mm-hmm. and really invest more heavily into those people. Tools, training, coaching, um, et cetera, to allow them to be more precise um, about who they're targeting and how they're how they're targeting them. And I can touch on that in a second too. Um, and... Um, and really then focus some of that training in terms of continuous outbound motion as well with account executives. A lot of teams that I've, I've evaluated, it's like SDR team does all of the outbound account executives just do appointments. And that's great in a perfect world. If your SDR team can book your entire day, your entire week and your entire month and your entire quarter with meetings, awesome. And they should probably be getting paid a lot more. Right. But, you know, as an account executive, you need to continue to, uh, to work on that too. In terms of the way I see things going is, uh, I think that, um, SDRs are anybody doing really new user acquisition probably needs to get a lot more comfortable with content in general. Um, just how they're, how they're, and what they're talking about. So we kind of touched on this the other day, just in passing, but like, I think recruiters are guilty of this as well, but salespeople for sure, when they're using LinkedIn, not for messaging, not for like in messages or emails, but when they're using it, they're talking about what they do. So salespeople are talking about being great salespeople. Um, but you've got this audience and you've got this way of still capturing people's attention and influencing them, the risk of calling them influencers. Um, why, why don't you turn that around to what you're actually selling in that industry? Mm-hmm. They could could have downstream effects of like unless you're selling sell, sales software, right? Obviously, yes, right. Uh, yeah, hundred percent. But but yeah. if I'm yeah if I'm if I'm talking about selling but on LinkedIn and cultivating an audience, but I'm selling veterinary software, I should probably talk about veterinarians instead. Right. And I, th- I think, you know, in a lot of cases, most, most people at all, but most stay in the same industry. So you don't necessarily have to talk about your specific company and be, be brand ambassadors for that company, although you should be while you're there. But that shouldn't be your focus. Your focus should be on what they do well for th- solving that problem. Uh, and if you're sticking to that, like even if you migrate companies, your audience can come with you. And think of think of the valuable asset that is to a company. Besides just hey, I know the industry, but hey, I know the industry, but I also have an audience of this many people. Kind of reminds me of the old um, ad ad days, you know, like when you would uh, switch for, as a sales director from one ad ad agency to another. There's hey, what are you bringing with you? Right, um, and you have demonstrable proof in this case. So. Anyway, and so, I mean, do salespeople have that that ability to generate content? I mean, anybody can start generating horseshit on ChatGPT, but how do you think about that? Well, I think that's really what's going to set people apart. I think people are already getting you know called out for it. 
uh, I think it's still pretty obvious uh, with all the talk of the power of LLMs. I think most people can still identify <laughs> artificially created stuff from uh, from not. That said, um, when I talked about like you know reducing headcount of SDRs from eight to three. Um, that's part of the reason because I said, hey, let's give them the tools and the coaching and the training to do it, just to to do the job right. And I think that that comes along with it. Um, I think being able to do that, spend less time showing them how to write a, an effective outbound email and start showing them how to write for a broader audience um, and create their own inbound flow as well. How are you thinking about partnerships? Can you give me an example? With, like just like selling well, through partners, like, you know, as like, uh, yeah, partner, partner led growth, you know, uh, using other, other software companies or consultancies to kind of get in front of customers as opposed to trying to battle through digital noise. Yeah. I think there, I think there's value there too. The, the problem I see with that is, you know, owned versus leased. Right. You know, um, I'd rather own that. Can it be, a, can it be an effective channel? Sure. Yeah, absolutely. But uh, I would not go all in on and, that. And yeah, and as an early stage company, I feel like that's it's more long tail. You know, the, mm-hmm. the path to ROI is harder. Um, and you um, you don't have that much money. Right? You can't I mean, you can't really do it unless you're like really good at it. Yeah. At the risk of pissing people off that may be, may be in this line of work that might see this podcast. Have you ever tried to use an outbound or outsourced SDR function? I haven't. No. Yeah. Don't. You used to be. You used to be a proponent for it, though, haven't you? Outsourced. Yeah, I think I remember you were working somewhere, and you said, "Yeah, use use like an outsourced SDR department first because you know you're going to learn a lot, but don't bring in that cost in house." Sure, sure. I think for testing messaging and stuff like that too, and you know, I I I've seen that work. That said, my my firsthand experience with doing that, even to test messaging, is you don't learn anything. <laughs> okay, um, so experiment yeah. failed. Well, it's like, hey, if I'm if I'm training you, well, it, if you're going to be my SDR, but then I have to go to your boss to train your boss and rely on him to communicate that message and actually do it, you know, uh, yeah, yeah, it's uh, it's. So, it's what are you excited cool. about over the next twelve months? I'm really excited. I shouldn't say excited, but I'm intrigued <laughs> to see what happens with the uh, email apocalypse with Gmail and Yahoo stuff. I haven't heard too much about it yet, but I imagine it's just being phased in right now. What is uh, the email apocalypse? Well, they've changed their rules on on um, the number of emails that can be sent out from a specific inbox domain Per day to a to another company. So oh dear, mm-hmm. yeah, that's yeah. gonna that's gonna hurt. Yeah, and I think it's really geared at obviously spam farms, you know, on the B two C side, but more more specifically as well. I think the people that really need to be concerned about it is anyone using mass emailing tools like uh, Outreach, Salesloft, Apollo that are using it in bulk. Because if you actually do the numbers, and I forget what they are offhand. Um, it would be really easy to get to those numbers where if you get like, it's like a fraction of a percent of reported unsubscribes, for example, Mm -hmm. you're done. So is Yahoo really that big of an email client still? No. And I think they were tagging along with Gmail on this. Yeah. Yeah. Can, can outreach like hack around that by going through multiple email addresses? Me, you mean can the users hack around it? Yeah, yes, yeah, so the users through via software saying, okay, we're going to blast this out, but instead of one email, we're going to blast it out through ten. Oh well, yes, but they're tracking at the domain level. Oh, got it, got it, got it. Yeah, well, that's going to hurt. That's my understanding, anyway. It's been a few months since I looked at it, but uh, yeah, there's a good article I can share with you afterwards too. Yeah, we'll put it in the show notes. Mm-hmm. Um, you're a masochist. You, you want to see it burn. I like it. <laughs> no, I'm interested in what sort of, you know, innovation is bred through desperation, right? Um, Correct. So I'm very interested to see how this really turns. Because even prior to this, 
thing. I've had this thought about LinkedIn, uh, not LinkedIn specifically, but influencing as a means of attracting new customers through your sales team, like training them to do it. Um, um, even prior to that. So when I saw this, I was like, man, this, this might really be, uh, coming faster than, uh, than I envisioned. So, yeah. Awesome. Uh, Matt, before we close out, what is your favorite book? Oh gosh. I wish you had prepped me for this. Mm -hmm. Uh, It's intentional. uh, (laughs) The Quran. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, no, there's no no religious sex. I think it's just some really interesting spiritual test. I, I think you know. Are are we talking specifically nonfiction? Is that sure? Like, Whatever. Okay. Um, I mean, I read a lot of fiction, so you know, on the fiction side, tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow is probably the best book I read uh, last year. What's that about? Uh, it's following a, a group of teens that develop a video uh, video game actually a video game company and sort of how it evolves uh over time as they grow older so it's sort of a you know decades long story that's cool um, yeah it's pretty it's pretty wild i'm not i'm not a video gamer so even if you're not like it's mm-hmm. uh it's a really interesting interesting book um um man i guess you know, I read uh, I read the book Disney Wars uh, last year too, from the nonfiction side. And Was it's that about, it's Iger? about Michael Eisner? No, it's Eisner, but Iger's in it uh, at, as he comes on board and stuff. And that was a really interesting, uh, interesting right. book. And what's the best piece of business advice you've ever received? Probably something I said to you. Oh, of course, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Probably during one of our epic tennis matches. Yeah, uh, <laughs> you want to see two people not good at tennis but try really hard. <laughs> you know, just two, fight to two, the death. Yeah, like just two two of us just like floating the ball over to each other, <laughs> going fuck. You know? noise. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> <laughs> just heading the ball into the net. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, one I w- a piece of advice I hopefully take today that I I did not take long in my. Uh, very long in my career, but I should have uh, taken this advice a lot earlier, which is, you know, uh, know what you don't know and be humble about it. Nice. And, uh, yeah, I wish I had done that a lot earlier. Yeah, me too. And still wish I could do that. <laughs> yeah. Everybody, thank you for listening to another episode of the Capital Stack. If you like what you heard, please subscribe, tell a friend. And we are here every Tuesday, and we will see you next week. Okay, thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you for tuning in to the Capital Stack Podcast. Make sure to share this with someone you know that can benefit from this content. Remember to support this show by rating, reviewing, and subscribing. David Paul is the founder and general partner at DWP Capital. All opinions expressed by David and podcast guests are solely their own opinions and do not reflect the opinion of DWP Capital. This podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be relied upon for decisions. David and guests may maintain positions in the securities discussed on this podcast.